So message for people watching the recording. If you're not here, you should be at class. That's all. <laughs> all right, so we are starting on chapter four. Maybe test three. We don't have as many sections um, for test three. Right. Chapter four is shorter than chapter three was for sure. Um, so this test will be, if I can remember correctly, let me look at the dates actually. Um, so this, this test will be somewhere around April 6th, or might, might be the 8th. I can't remember exactly where I've got it mapped out going. Okay, so we'll have um, next week, spring break and then another week and we'll be almost ready for for test three then so, so let, less material on this one all right so in chapter four we're still doing derivatives we're still doing derivatives but we're applying them and really what we're don't get too excited um it's not anything uh, any kind of super awesome application. What we're really focusing on is we're focusing on applying derivatives to analyzing functions. Analyzing functions. So, um, yeah, that's the main thing. So we, we have the main thing in this chapter is we'll have several theorems, and then we're just applying those theorems to analyzing graphs and analyzing functions. And then we also have one section that just kind of gets thrown in. You can kind of pick where you put it. But the, the last section in this chapter, we actually go back and do one more section of limits. And we'll have a, a new technique we can use that mixes the idea of derivatives and limits together. So we look forward to that. It's not hard. And so in 4.1, okay, how we're starting out is we're starting out um, finding the maximum and minimum values of functions. Um, we're going to look at when we're guaranteed that they occur, because okay? you can't have a function that has neither, no max, no min. You'd have a function that has one. You'd have a function that has both. Okay? And then we're also going to um, talk about what our textbook calls local maximum and minimum values as well. Okay? That's our, our goal in this section. Okay. So, this is not completely pointless. Okay. Um, it's, it's actually really useful um, because what we're thinking about big picture wise is that we have, have some function that models some behavior. And then what's really nice is that we could find the minimum or the maximum value of that function. So in that case, we're optimizing something. So we're optimizing a function, and functions can be applied to practically everything. Um, so it boils down. It looks not all that useful on the surface, because okay, we're just like looking at a graph and looking at a function and finding the minimum and maximum value, but it has tons of applications. Okay. Even really this idea, you have um, extensions of this into higher dimensions where you are um, doing things like um, artificial intelligence and machine learning and that kind of thing. So, um, even though it looks kind of not all in, that impressive when we do it on a two-dimensional graph, it is really useful. It's really useful. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna orient ourselves to what we're what we're talking about by a minimum and a maximum. Okay. So. Here we've got this curve, and you can check it with a vertical line test. It passes the vertical line test, so this would be a function. Okay. And what we're thinking about, we're thinking about where the greatest or the least y value occurs. Okay. So here, if we did f of 3, that would be this point. Okay. 
So that would be our maximum y value we could get out of this function. And then the lowest point happened at 6, so f of 6, here we get our smallest y value out of this function. Okay, so here we have a maximum, here we have a minimum. Okay, and we can talk about two things. We can talk about where the minimum or maximum occurs, that's an x value. Or we can talk about what the actual minimum or maximum value of the function is. And that would be a y value or an f of x value. So here we could say f of 3 is 5. And that's our maximum. And say f of 6 is 2. That would be our minimum. Okay. That's maybe not all that enlightening just yet. But just kind of getting on the same page with what we're talking about. I got a couple definitions here on that last graph. We can even be more specific. We can say that we have an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum. Okay, so the definition for that here says if we have a number in the domain of the function, then f of that number is an absolute maximum if f of c is greater than f of x for all other x's in the domain. And then there's the minimum if f of c is we got a typo there. The minimum value if f of c is less than or equal to. So this should be less than or equal to for a minimum. Okay. So all we're saying there is that if that point on the graph is the biggest that we can get in the whole domain, that's the absolute maximum. If that point's the smallest y value we can get out of all the x's in the whole domain, that is the absolute minimum. Okay. And there are other terminologies. Sometimes you'll see these called global maximums and global minimums. And if we want to talk about the two together, so if we want to talk about maximums and minimums, that's actually a bad grammar there. But if we want to talk about maximums and minimums, we talk about the extreme value of a function. I say that's bad grammar. We might as well do a little bit of English in here. So we have a maximum, that's singular, what would the plural be? Not maximums. Okay. No, just the plural of maximum. So singular, if we have one, we call it a maximum, and that's usually all we talk about, um, just in day-to-day -day language, but if we have multiple maximum, values, we call them, or they are, close with their maxima, maxima, and their maxima. And then same thing with minimum. And another way you see these extreme values referenced is you'll see instead of extreme values, you'll see extrema. Extrema. So our textbook might get into it in the next section. I'm not sure, but if you see the term extrema, that's kind of a weird term. But we're just talking about minima and maxima, okay, minimums and maximums. If you want to go Alabama. Okay. You know you're going to get a grammar lesson today, did you? Okay, so those are our extreme values. Okay, those are our extreme values. Okay, so let's look at a graph. Let's analyze this thing a little bit. Okay, we've got some x values marked on here: a, b, c, d, e. Okay. So where would our 
absolute maximum the curve. Yeah, maximum. It'd be F of D. It'd be F of D because the absolute biggest point that we can get, just looking at the part we've got, and we're assuming this is the whole thing, is it D? So F of D would be our absolute maximum. Okay. And then what about our absolute minimum? Bit F of A. That's the absolute lowest Y value you can get. Okay. We also have something else we're going to be concerned with. Okay. Um, if you look down at the last line here, we can also have local maxima and minima that we want to describe. So there, hard to define in Cal 1, a little bit. Um, so let's look at our definition and we'll come back. Here's our definition of local maximum, local minimum. So it says the number F of C is the local maximum if F of C is greater than all the other f of x is when x is near c. And then we got a local minimum. This one got it right. If f of c is less than or equal to all the other f of x is when x is near c. So uh, near is very generic. And Turns out you gotta get pretty technical to get a good definition on that. So more technical than we're gonna get in Cal One. Um, but here they do they do specify a little bit. It says if we say that something is near C, that's just saying that there's some open interval containing C where that statement is true. Okay. So we can we can kind of go intuitively. On that definition, we can just say if we're looking at x values that are, you know, in the in the neighborhood, okay, around in proximity to C, then we can get a local maximum or local minimum. So let's look on the graph. Okay. Uh, thinking about it geometrically, it's easy to tell when you try to de actual define what you mean by being near some number. It gets tricky. Okay. So we said absolute minimum, so f of a. Absolute maximum is the F of D. So like if we look at F of C, you can tell that that Y value is lower than the other Y values around it. Okay. So we would say we have a local minimum at F of C. Okay. Or we could say the same thing at F of E. Okay. This Y value is smaller than the y values around it. Okay. So we would say we have a local minimum at f of e. Okay. We could say something similar for f of b. Here, that y value is bigger than the y values around it on both sides. And so we could say we have a local maximum at f of b. Okay. And usually, you can kind of translate a little bit and get a little bit out of the math jargon. And you can say if we have a like a hilltop, then that's going to be a local maximum. Or if we have some type of valley in the graph, then that's going to be a local minimum. Okay. Okay. Hanging in there so far? You got anything else? All right. We just got enough. Vocabulary we're having to get through here. Okay. So here's another picture. Okay. Um, so looking at this one, okay. F of 4 gives us a local minimum. That's like a valley. Okay. Um, F of 8 would give us a local max because we have like a hilltop. And then F of 12 would give us a local minimum because we have a valley. And then it turns out this is also not just a local minimum, it's absolute minimum because it's smaller than 
every other Y value on the graph. So you can be both. You can be a local and absolute minimum or a local and absolute maximum. Um, why is this one not an absolute maximum? Yeah, up here. Up here, that's above that, so not absolute. Okay. That one looks in. Yep. Yeah, so let me think about that. So can we have an absolute extrema, extremum without, without it being a local? Yes, but we've got to get just a little bit more vocabulary. So you can't have absolute that is not a local. We're getting there. Thanks. We're getting there. It looks a little bit different. But we're getting there. So good thinking. Good thinking. Um, yeah. Look at this one. So here we've got cosine. Thing. And the domain of cosine is negative infinity to positive infinity. Here we're just looking at just this piece. Okay, but we're talking about it like we're thinking about the whole graph on this one. That can be a little bit confusing sometimes. Are we just talking about the piece that we see or are we talking about the actual whole thing? Okay. So with cosine, okay, every time we have a peak, we've got a local and absolute maximum. Okay. Um, so you can have absolute maximum that occurs more than once and okay, if they're all the same value. Okay. Same thing with locals. And then at every trough, okay, every valley, We've got a local and absolute minimum. So every odd multiple of pi, we have a local and absolute minimum of negative one. And then at every even um, multiple of pi, we have a local and absolute maximum. Okay. So you can have multiples. On that one. All right. Okay, so we put all this together, we get this theorem called the extreme value theorem. Okay. It tells us what conditions we need in order for a function to be guaranteed to have extreme value. Because we can't have a function that has none. Right? Um, we didn't have an example of that, but I can give you one real quick. Yep. The function passes the vertical line test, has no local anything, uh -huh. has no absolute because it goes up forever, goes down forever. So, um, straight line like that has no extrema. Okay. If we're thinking about from negative infinity to positive infinity as the domain. Okay, so when do we know a function has extrema? Okay. So, first thing it says if we have a function that is continuous, okay. what's continuous mean? Anyway. Draw without picking up your pencil, yeah, that's a good intuitive definition there. You can draw without picking up your pencil on a closed interval. So what's important about it calling it a closed interval? Yeah, and even more specific, what's the difference between a closed interval and an open interval? That's what I want to know. Includes the endpoint. It includes the endpoint. Right, so with an open interval, we would write a to B, and that would not include A, would not include B, it's just everything between those two. Yeah. But the closed interval with the brackets, we include A, we include B, so those endpoints are important okay, for this. So our function's gotta be continuous. On the closed interval, then we have an absolute minimum 
and an absolute maximum. I guess I said that backward, have absolute maximum and an absolute minimum at some numbers in our closed interval. So there are some x values in that closed interval that will give us an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum. So you might be a little skeptical about that, but keep the two conditions in mind. Okay. Function's got to be continuous on our interval, and it's got to be continuous on the closed interval, so we're including the endpoint. Okay. So let's look at some graphs. Here's one, continuous on closed interval between A and B, it's continuous because it has the endpoints on there. I mean, it's closed interval because it has the endpoints, continuous because we can no jumps or breaks or holes. So here, our absolute maximum would be at F of C, and our absolute minimum would be at F of B. That's kind of our typical picture. And the second one is continuous on the closed interval. We got the endpoints. Our absolute maximum would be f of c. You'd say, well, we don't have a valley. You're right. We don't have a valley shape anywhere on there. But our absolute minimum occurs at the endpoint. It occurs at the endpoint here. So without that endpoint, if we had a an open circle here, we had an open interval that we were working with, then the extreme value theorem wouldn't hold. And you got to have the endpoints included. And then here's one, continuous again, closed interval. So we've got an absolute maximum, to make sure they're even, absolute maximum at C1 and C2, and uh, absolute minimum at D. So what happens if we violate our conditions? Okay, so what happens if our function is not continuous? How does that make it possible for us to not have extreme value? Or what if we're continuous but not on the closed interval, on the open interval? Okay, so here in those situations. So on this one, we've got the endpoints, but our function is not continuous on the whole interval because we have a discontinuity here. I'm, I'm guessing that's supposed to be a one. And we have a, have a jump discontinuity there. So on that one, we have an absolute minimum. That happened here, two. But we don't have an absolute maximum. The absolute maximum would be here, but that point's undefined. So what happens? Why do we say we don't have an absolute maximum there? Yeah, it's not continuous. We're just thinking like what's happening on the graph. It's a little bit deep here. Okay. So if we're trying to get follow our graph and we're trying to get, we would just say, okay, well, let's just get as close to that point as we can. What happens? Think about like zooming in. It just keeps zooming and zooming forever, right? We can just keep getting closer and closer and closer and closer to one without actually ever getting there. Right? There's always some next number that would, be, that would come. Like you can do 1.9 and you can do 1.99, 1.9999, keep, keep doing that forever. We never actually get there, so we don't actually have an absolute maximum there. Right, so just that one point being missing there causes trouble. In this one, we don't have either one. We don't have an absolute maximum or absolute minimum. We don't have a minimum for a similar reason to the first one because we're missing that point there. So we can just keep getting closer and closer and closer and closer, but we never actually get there. So we can make our y values smaller and smaller and smaller, but they don't ever actually 
turn into a minimum. And we can get a limit, but we can't actually get a minimum value out. And then here, it's easier to see. You know, our function just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Goes off toward infinity. We've got a vertical asymptote here, so no absolute maximum there. And so this one, the interval's closed, but it's not continuous, is the whole thing. You gotta have a discontinuity. This one's continuous over the whole open interval. But because the interval's open, we've got issues on both ends. That kind of sort of makes sense. If we're in sort of making sense territory, we're in good shape. Okay. So now let's make an observation. And that just says the same stuff we just said. Okay. Make an observation. So if we go back and we look at where these extreme values occur, okay. one thing kind of pops up. If we have a hilltop, like a peak, or if we have a valley or a trough of a wave, if you want to think about it that way, what's special about those points on our curve thinking about their derivative? What's the derivative going to be at those places? So at those places, at, so at a hilltop or at a valley, we'll have a horizontal tangent line. What does that mean about our derivative, the value? Remember? So remember the derivative is the slope of the tangent line. So if our tangent lines are horizontal, what's our slope there? Zero. Slope zero. Because right. if we have a horizontal, here you're right. If we have a horizontal tangent line, that means our slope zero at those places. Okay. So that's going to be important. Um, if we're not, in fact, if we're not thinking about the endpoints. The only way that we can get either a maximum or a minimum okay, relative or not relative, local maximum or a minimum is if we're at some point on the graph where our slope is zero, or in other words, where we have a horizontal tangent line. Okay. So we get a theorem out of that. Says if a local maximum or a minimum occurs at some x value, let's see, and we've got something else that goes with it, and if the derivative of f at c exists, then the derivative at c is zero. So this part doesn't really show up in our picture we looked at. Well, that has to be true. So the reason why we have to include that is because if we have a situation where our derivative does not exist, it's possible that we can get a minimum or a maximum there as well. And so, like, uh, we'll look at that. First, we've got one other thing to talk about here. So, if we follow the logic on this theorem, okay, we're starting with knowledge that we have a local maximum or minimum at some value, at some x value. And we're saying if that's true, then if the derivative exists, the derivative is zero. This thing generally does not work in reverse. Okay. It generally does not work in reverse. So just because we have somewhere that our derivative is zero, that does not guarantee us that we have a maximum or a minimum at that value. Okay. 
so it's possible we could have a horizontal tangent line and it not be a maximum or minimum. So to that effect, let's look at this one. Okay. So we've got x cubed. Our derivative is 3x squared. So if you solve that for 0, now we get 0 when we plug in 0. So at the x value 0, we have a horizontal tangent line. but we don't have a local maximum or a minimum there. All that's happening with our graph is it's just, it's just crossing over the tangent line. Okay. We don't have a valley or we don't have a, a peak. Okay. Does that make sense? Cracking with me? Okay. So just because <clears throat> Just because our derivative is zero does not mean we have <clears throat> a local minimum or maximum, but if we know we have a local minimum or maximum somewhere and the derivative exists, we know that the slope there has to be zero, or that the derivative there is zero. And uh -oh, then let's look at this one. Now just looking at the graph, absolute value of x, we have a local minimum at x equals 0. In fact, it's absolute minimum. But we do not have a horizontal tangent on here. where The derivative is not 0 because, remember, on a corner, if we have a sharp corner like that, our function is not differentiable there. So at x equals 0, our derivative does not exist. But we do have a local minimum. We have a local minimum. So that's an example of why we have to have that. If the derivative exists, we know the derivative is 0. Right there, that one doesn't exist. Okay. Questions on, on that one? We're about to tie it all together. This ends up in a nice little neat package when we get to it. Um, so we need uh, another definition here. Okay. And then it cleans things up if we, we make a new definition. Okay. Um, oh, one more slide, sorry. Here's our... Definition. So we've seen there's two ways we can have a local minimum or a local maximum. Either the derivative is zero, and then we can have a local minimum or maximum there, or we could have a situation where the derivative does not exist, and we can have a local minimum or maximum there. So as a definition here, we're going to define a critical number of a function um, to be a number in the domain. So that either, we're just covering both cases, either the derivative at that number is zero or the derivative at that number does not exist. And if we do that, if we lump those two together and give them the name critical numbers, then we can reword that last theorem and we can say if f has a local maximum or minimum at c, then c is a critical number. So that means either the derivative is zero or the derivative is undefined. The derivative does not exist. Okay. That tidies that up a little bit. Okay. Okay. Questions here? Okay. So now, here's our nice payoff. What we want to be able to do is we want to be able to find minimum and maximum values. Okay. Um, right now we're going to focus on absolute maximum and absolute minimum values. And we'll get more into the, the locals a little bit later. Okay. So here's our, our process. Now we've got three steps. 
So, so and again, make, make sure you remember this only applies if we know our function is continuous at every number in some closed interval. And so it's got to be continuous on the whole interval. We've got to have the endpoints included. So first, we find the critical numbers of our function that are in the open interval. The reason why we're only caring about the open interval there is because we're also going to include the endpoints. So that's step two. We find the values of f at the endpoint. And then we just compare the values. Okay? We just compare the values. So the critical numbers and the endpoints are our only candidates for an absolute maximum or absolute minimum. So if we find the critical numbers, check the value there, check the value at the endpoints, we've got the list of all the suspects. Okay? And then we just compare the values. The biggest value on our list is going to be the absolute maximum. The smallest value on our list is going to be the absolute minimum. Okay. Step one takes the longest. Okay. Because to find the critical numbers, what are those? There are places where our derivative equals zero or our derivative does not exist. So that means we've got to find the derivative. Okay. And then we can find the critical numbers. Once we have those critical numbers, we plug those into our function. We plug the endpoints into our function and then pick out the biggest and the smallest. Okay. That's the backbone of this whole section. That's our, basically you learn this one process and you've got this section mastered. So let's look at a couple of examples. So let's see here, we want to find the critical numbers. Sorry, we got some algebra comes into play. If algebra is not your favorite, So here's one that can be just a little bit tough-ish. So and then we're thinking of okay, okay. There's there's our function. Okay. It's not real not real pretty because we've got that fractional exponent. So the algebra is a little bit a little bit tougher. On this one, I mean, the easy ones you, you've got. Okay. Um, so, to find the critical numbers, critical numbers are where the derivative equals zero, or yeah, you're okay, or where the derivative is, does not exist. Okay. So, first we need to find the derivative. Okay. So, we want f prime. As far as finding derivatives, it's not too too bad. No. We got a couple of options. What are your thoughts on finding the derivative? What we could do product rule, or there's at least one more really good way. We could distribute and then just use the power rule. Okay. Either way, okay. um, I tend if I can multiply it out first. Um, usually you have less simplifying to do on these, but that's what I want to do. You should, uh, you have to do a little bit more simplification. You should end up in the same place. Here simplification does come into play because whatever we get for the derivative, we've got to solve it for when it equals zero. So we don't want a big mess if we can help it. So I'm going to distribute first. So we'll have 4x to the 3 fifths minus the outer exponents here, so x to the 3 fifths 
times x to the first, we've got to get a common denominator, so that'd be x to the five fifths. So three fifths plus five fifths, we get x to the eight fifths. And then we can use the power rule to get our derivative. So we got three fifths times four. 12 over 5, x to the negative 2 fifths, we're going to subtract 1. And then 8 fifths times negative 1 gives us negative 8 fifths, x, and we subtract 1 to the 3 fifths. So, now what? We need to know when this thing is zero or when the derivative does not exist. So, especially for finding when the derivative does not exist, that would be a situation where it's undefined. It's good to get rid of negative exponents. So, sadly, we work on that a little bit. So instead of x to the negative 2 fifths in the top, we can say that's 12 over 5 x to the 2 fifths. And then minus 8x to the 3 fifths over 5. Hmm. Just looking at this, I'm thinking ahead. Well, it might actually, part of this might actually be a little bit easier if you do product rule. Just the algebra. That's not too bad. This gives us one of them easy. So, let's start with um, making note of where this thing would be undefined. What x value makes that happen? Yep. If we tried to plug in zero, we get zero in the denominator here. And that would be undefined. So our derivative does not exist when x equals zero. Okay, so that's one thing to look for. Look for your denominators. See if there's anywhere you're going to get zero on the denominator. Okay. So that's one critical number, x equals zero, because our derivative does not exist there. The second one's a little messier on this one. Like I said, this was a little bit more challenging than some of the ones you'll have. The second thing we need to know is we need to know when 12 over 5x to the 2 fifths minus 8x to the 3 fifths over 5 equals 0. A little bit ugly. It's not going to be too bad. What I would do on one like this, and well, let me ask you, anybody have an idea? Solving this thing, it's not like a standard quadratic equation or anything. So I have to be a little bit more creative than that. I got stopped. Let me tell you my idea again. So what I'm thinking is we add 8x to the 3 fifths over 5 to both sides. Is 
the help giving them there. Cross multiply, cross multiply. And so then 12 times 5 is 60. This one's a little bit uglier, but it's not, we already have a common denominator. So 8 times 5 is 40. And then when we multiply, we add our exponents. So we get x to the 5 over 5. x to the 5 over 5 is just x. And then what? Divide both sides by 40. So x is 60 over 40, or x is... Here's one critical number, 3 over 2. The other critical number was 0. So I'm just going to put them on a list. x equals 0, x equals 0, 2. That's all this one wanted was our critical number. That one was a little bit trickier to solve for zero. So I wanted to do one with where the algebra is not basic. So the slope would be zero. Yeah, we have a horizontal tangent line. Yeah. Yeah, because our theorem says, well, our definition of critical number says that that's the critical number is where the slope is zero or where the derivative is undefined. So that's really what we're going for here. But the reason why we care about where the slope is zero is because if we have a minimum or a maximum, it either occurs where the slope is zero or where the derivative is undefined. So we're just narrowing down our list from an infinite number of x values we have to consider in our interval to some finite list that we can check. In this case, it was very finite, right? just two. So for this function, if we have an absolute maximum or absolute minimum, they've got to occur to these places. This function, if we took it right now, we're considering it being defined over the whole real number line, so our other theorem doesn't apply because we don't have a closed interval here. But if we took this function and looked at it on some closed interval, then our absolute minimum or absolute maximum would either have to occur at these two numbers or at the endpoints of our closed interval. And we would be guaranteed we had both because this function would be continuous there if, if it was continuous on our closed interval. So let's do one where we can find the, actually find the number. So that's just defining the critical numbers part. And you want to look at the graph of this thing? We might as well. Have one. And then we'll do one where we. Kind of nasty when you start getting the. Um, fractional exponents in there. So. A little hard to know what the graph's going to look like. So we've got x to the what is it uh, three fifths and that one times four minus x. So there's our graph, and it turns out. One and a half would be a, be a max there. We weren't guaranteed that we had that yet because we we didn't define a closed interval that we were looking at. But, and we can see it on the graph. So kind of kind of weird looking because we have kind of pretty smooth looking curve here and then it just kind of
kicks off pretty much with it there. Right. One more, one more. I leave that up because we can check our our graph on this next one too. So this one says find the absolute maximum and minimum. Is our function x to the third minus 3x squared plus 1 and then it's going to give us our interval we're looking at negative 1 half to 4 inclusive so that's a closed interval um, you could write this this way. Well, I'm not real sure why the textbook gives it to us in inequality notation. So, first of all, this problem statement seems really certain that we have an absolute maximum and minimum. And the way it can be certain is that this is a polynomial. You remember where polynomials are continuous? What domain? Polynomials are continuous everywhere. So polynomials are continuous on the whole row number line. And then we're, we're going to narrow it down and only consider the closed interval, negative 1 half to 4. So our polynomial will be continuous on this closed interval. So since our, we have a continuous function on this closed interval, we're guaranteed that we have an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum. So now we just need to find them. So step one, we've got to find our critical number. Or we've got to find where our derivative equals zero. So first we need the derivative. This one's not too bad. I do power rules, so what's our derivative on this one? We have 3x squared minus 6x. Okay. There's our derivative. Now we want to know where that derivative has a value of 0, where we have a horizontal tangent line. So what do we do? We can set it equal to 0. And just solve it and find, find it where it happens. Okay. What about solving this one? Back to the basics on this one. What can we do? You could, yeah, but then we've got an X on both sides. You're missing some basic techniques here. Yeah, do we have anything in common? So we have 3x in common. We have x minus 2. If we have a product that equals 0, going back to 112, huh? if we have a product that equals 0, that means either this equals 0, this equals 0, or both. So we said each factor equal to zero, it's all. So we can have the equation 3x equals zero, x minus two equals zero. So the first one, 3x equals zero, so x is zero. Another one, we add two to both sides, so x is two. Okay. So these are critical numbers. Okay. Yep. Two. Well, no, okay, that's, those are critical numbers. What else? We've got one other thing to check. Is there anywhere that our 
derivative would not exist. Is there any x value that's not in the domain? It's just polynomial, so it's defined for all the x values in our interval. And so again, our interval is negative one half to four, so um, we don't have to don't have the situation where our derivative does not exist on this one. So these are our only critical numbers, zero and two. Okay. So now, going by the textbook, we need to find f of zero and f of two. To evaluate our function of these. So our function was x cubed minus 3x squared plus 1. So we got 0 cubed minus 3 times 0 squared plus 1. What's that going to give us? 1. And then 2 cubed minus 3 times 2 squared. Plus one, that one we actually have to do a little bit of arithmetic, so let's see that eight. Square the two, we get four. So negative three times four is negative 12. Plus one, negative three, okay, negative three. So these are two candidates for the absolute maximum, absolute minimum. We've got two other numbers we need to check. What other two numbers do we need to check? Yeah, negative one half and four. We need to check the endpoints. Okay, negative one half and four. So, step two, we check the endpoints. Okay. So, we need to find f of negative one half. Four. Was it? Yeah, negative one half. Okay. So this one's a little bit messier. We've got negative one half cubed minus three times negative one half squared. You can use a calculator on these. Don't stress over that. I'm gonna try and do it without it. So if we cube a fraction, that means we cube the top and we cube the bottom. And since it's odd, we keep the sign, so we have minus 1 over 8. Okay. And then square, we square the top, square the bottom, and it'll be positive, so that'll be minus 3 times 1 fourth plus 1. So let's see, let me give us a little more room here. We need a common denominator. That's negative 3 over 4, so that's negative 6 over 8. So that's 8 over 8. So negative 7 over 8 plus 8 over 8. So 1 8. Again, just punch it in the calculator. It's fine. It's faster. Nothing wrong with that. And then we need f of 4. So we have 4 cubed minus 3 times 4 squared plus 1. Yeah, so that's 64. 16 times 4, 64. And then negative 3 times 16 would be negative 48 plus 1. Seven, yep, sounds right. 17. Okay. So, now, we've got four candidates for absolute minimum, absolute maximum. So what's our absolute minimum? Negative three. Just the smallest one. And then what's our absolute maximum? 17.
And then if we want to know it, this one didn't ask it, but it just said find the actual values. But if we wanted to know it, we could say our absolute minimum occurs at x equals 2. And our absolute maximum occurs at x equals 4. So the only thing that changes on these, we're going to do the same process on any of these. The only thing that changes is the algebra you have to do. So you have to find the derivative. That might be a little different depending on the function. And then the algebra you have to do to solve it for zero. Check it to see if, we're, if it's undefined anywhere, if the derivative does not exist. And then you just take those critical numbers and the endpoint, plug it into the function, and figure out which one's the biggest, which one's the smallest. Because if we have an absolute, well, so we, we know we have an absolute minimum and absolute maximum. Um, but we also know that the only place that those can occur okay, are either where the derivative is zero, that's these two. Yeah. Or where the derivative is, does not exist. We didn't have one of those on this. But that would be a critical number two. So either at the critical numbers where the derivative is zero, where the derivative does not exist, or at the endpoint. Those are the only numbers we have to check. Because we know that the absolute minimum, absolute maximum has to occur at one of those three places where the derivative is zero, where the derivative does not exist. Right, so that would be a critical number. We have a critical number where the derivative does not exist. So that would be on our critical number list up here. Yeah, it would. Yep. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, critical number can be a minimum or maximum, or n neither. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any questions? Thoughts? All right, that's it then. Thank you. Dun, 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 dun.